Sing. Welcome to the class. Second thing, what are we going to be doing? Why am I doing this class? I'm doing this class because I learned how to make late period doublets from lots of nice people who were willing to teach me and do, you know, do, do things for me. And I've made a lot of mistakes across the way. And I'm, what I'm trying to do with this class is help you get through this without making quite as many mistakes as I did. What I will be teaching is not necessarily period techniques. Some of them will be. Some of them will be modern techniques that I learned to help me construct. Okay? This is not a perfectly period doublet technique class. This is about making Elizabethan doublets that look good, are functional, can be used for both rapier if we make them rapier legal, or you know, just looks, and you know, are easy to make. A lot of tech, some of the techniques we're going to be here are, are just modern. I'm just going to, you know, we're going to be using machines and everything else like that. So, you know, do not take this as gospel as this is the period way to do it. Yeah, you know, but this is just the way I learned how to do it. Okay, some of the techniques I used could be wrong. They work for me. They don't work for you. I'm sorry. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. As for questions, as we go along, this is the first time I'm doing anything like this. Uh, so the questions will help me as we move along. Uh, what I'm going to do, if you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll write your name down on the board and then, you know, try to remember it. You know, that way you don't have to hold your hand up the whole time. And then when I get to a point where I'm ready to answer some questions, I'll, I'll see if I've answered your question already or if you have something, a new way to take us. We're going to try and avoid tangents, but I get off on tangents, so it happens. Okay. This is just an orientation class to kind of take you through what we're going to do over the course of these next few weeks. Uh, the goal, the goal by the end of this series of classes is for you to have constructed an Elizabethan doublet beginning to end, including making the pattern, picking out the fabric, prepping the fabric, putting on the embellishments, everything okay that way you know it's completely hands-on i'm going to be showing you how to do stuff but you will be responsible for doing it cost of this class not, i'm not going to charge you anything but uh you will probably need to purchase some fabric at some point uh, i will be providing some of the materials i will have some extra fabric that you know that you may need you know you may use uh, I'll be providing stuff like paper for making patterns uh, you know, and little knickknacks here and there. But, you know, you will be expected to maybe purchase some fabrics that you want to use for your doublet, maybe some embellishments, that kind of thing. As far as machines go, if you have a sewing machine, yes, that's great. You can bring it and use it. Do you need to purchase a sewing machine? No. But if you want to continue to make outfits, you'll probably want to get one eventually. So we're going to talk about, so what we're going to talk about yeah, so that's basically the goal of the class, okay? What we're going to talk about today is tools that you may wish to purchase and, you know, will probably need to complete doublets and stuff like that. Uh, fabrics, fabrics that you can use and everything else like that. Uh, what kind of patterns we're going to be using and, you know, embellishments that can be used for, you know, you know, Elizabethan style garments, okay? I want to start off by saying you don't have to be perfect or know anything about sewing to do this, okay? When I first learned how to sew, I certainly wasn't perfect. And the thing, I can't even sew a straight line. Guess what? Neither can I. Okay? Sewing is not a perfect um, activity. If you expect perfection, uh, you shouldn't be sewing. Okay? I am a something of an anal retentive person. I am very much a perfectionist and I had to eliminate that from my personality as far as sewing goes. Otherwise, I would never be able to do the projects I do. Okay? You have to be willing to let some stuff go if you want to complete projects. Okay? I'm just going to say it right off that. This here is the first garment I ever made. Okay? I'm going to pass it around so you guys can look at it. It's a very simple Italian doublet. No, I don't fit in it anymore. Okay, I have pictures. I have posted them to Facebook every now and then of me wearing this with a very lovely codpiece. 
Um, yeah. And as I pass it around, you will see there are top stitching mistakes, you know, it's coming apart and everything else like that. It's not perfect, but it's very lovely and, and it, it got me started, okay? So I'm going to pass this around just so you guys can look at it. It's got awful trim on it and metal things and, you know, it's a, you know. That was made with a pattern that was purchased in a fabric store, okay? And you can certainly use those patterns. The problem I have with those patterns, you know, or any store-bought pattern, is simply that those patterns are made to fit a wide variety of people. And so they are not custom-made to you and your body, your form. Okay, the human body is not something that really likes to put itself into little succinct boxes. Everybody's a little bit different, you know, tall, short, skinny, heavy, that kind of thing. Everybody's going to be a little bit different. We all have curves in different places. And so, you know, what we're going to do in here is we're actually going to learn how to draft our own patterns. Um, we're going to use a mixture of systems that I have learned over the years. And uh, hopefully, you know, you'll be able to pick up on some of the techniques. But if you do wish to go to the store and buy a pattern or something like that, you know, bring it in. I'll look at it and I'll tell you whether it's useful or not. Uh, some of the people who do make patterns uh, that may be useful for you, and, you know, I will help you out if you want to use a pattern. Margo Anderson makes some wonderful period patterns. These are actually pretty complicated, though, and I find them difficult to follow. But they are really, really good, and they come with a lot of instruction and stuff like that. But Margot Anderson does make some really, really good patterns if, like, for whatever reason, you, you end up missing most of the classes and you want to just get a pattern. It's a great place to start. The other place is uh, Reconstructing History. They make some wonderful, easy-to-understand patterns. Uh, sometimes they don't fit quite right. <laughs> you have to adjust the fitting and everything else like that. The nice thing about the patterns that I make um, and that we're going to learn how to draft is they're going to be fit for movement. And that's the other big problem with, star, with store bought patterns is they're fit for looks, okay, how it looks when you're standing still versus fit for movement, actually being able to move and function and everything else like that. Obviously, I use my, my doublets for fighting in all the time. And, you know, you know, I have to be able to move. I have to have mobility. And so that's what we're looking for when we do this, okay? All right. Uh, books that we're going to be using for reference, yeah, that are actually great books to use for reference in late period costuming. We're going to start with the Bible. <laughs> Janet Arnold's Patterns of Fashion. Uh, this is actually a series of four books, five books. Um, then one of them covers uh, late period uh, 1560 to 1620. These are some of the best books for getting ideas for designs and patterns and everything else like that. She, she uses nothing but extant pieces, in other words, pieces that are surviving from the period. She has managed to get into the museums and fondle them and you know, do all sorts of fun little things. And what she does is in the back of the book, you know, she actually draws them out on graph paper. And so you can actually transfer the pattern directly. It's a one inch, one square equals one inch. And you'll be able to, you can make the pattern exactly as she found it from the extant garment. And so this is a really, really, it is, like I said, it's the Bible. <laughs> and so, it's a great book to get. Um, again, it's Patterns of Fashion by Janet Arnold. Uh, the other one that she did, that, you know, it's uh, the next one up was uh, basically it's collars and undergarments, shirts and, you know, underwear and everything else like that. So this is a, another really good one to get. Um, this book here, Patterns for Theatrical Costumes, uh, is the first book I got of patterns. <laughs> And it's got a lot of period, and it includes a lot of neat little things on embellishments and stuff like that. The nice thing about this one is it covers a lot of different periods, including, you know, 16th, 17th century, and even beyond into Civil War era and stuff like that. The patterns in it give you, the nice thing about this book is it gives you a nice general shape for the pattern, okay? 
and you can use that to draft your pattern off of and stuff like that. You know, and you can just go through and say, oh, okay, so that's what the pattern should basically look like. And then that'll give you an idea of how to draft it out. Now, when I say drafting patterns or draping patterns, we'll go into the differences of, on that on the day we do patterns, okay? All right. Uh, the Tudor Taylor is another one that is great for getting ideas from and looking at what they actually wore. Again, they went through and they actually, you know, not only did extant pieces, they went into the paintings and stuff like that and looked at, now this is slightly before Elizabethan, obviously, this is Henry's time, which is just before the Elizabethan time, but again, it's, it's right next to the late period, so it's a great, again, a great resource for looking at. We didn't bring the other one that's the other great resource, which is Elizabeth's Wardrobe Unlocked. Uh, it's an expensive book, and so we didn't want to bring it here. Uh, but it is, a, again, Elizabeth's Wardrobe Unlocked is, uh, again, they went in and they literally took Elizabeth's wardrobe through paintings and through extant pieces and looked at them and, were, and just made this wonderful, wonderful book. Um, it, it is rather expensive. Uh -huh. The two main books we'll be using for the pattern making, uh, one is called the Spanish Tailor's Handbook, or, you know, the Tailor's Pattern Book. As you can see, this book was originally published in 1589, okay? This is the Amazon version, okay? The first half of the book is the actual book as it was written, okay? It's in Spanish, old Spanish, and you won't be able to read it. But as you can see, it actually has pattern layouts as if they were laid out on the fabric before they got cut. And so, you know, these are obviously the actual patterns that were made and everything else like that. Got all these weird markings on, on how to do measurements and stuff like that. And the nice part is the back of the book is in English. This is the translation back here. <laughs> so, you know, you can get this one on Amazon. Uh, it's, it says $40 on the back. I mean, you can maybe find it cheaper or whatever. But again, for doing late period design, this is a wonderful resource because, let's face it, it was written in the period, so, you know, it, you know, and it is a great resource. Um, the person who turned me on to that book is the person that has written these two books, The Modern Maker and the, the Volume 1 and Volume 2. Uh, these books were written by a man named Matthew Nagy. Uh, Nagy is spelled G-N-A-G-Y. <laughs> uh, Matthew Nagy is, in my opinion, the foremost authority in late period tailoring. Not costume, not garb, actual tailoring. He's a modern tailor that has managed to reverse engineer all the techniques they use, or most of the techniques that they use to actually tailor the garb back in the late 17th, early 18th, or late, late 16th, early 10th, 17th century. Uh, these books are awesome. We're going to be using the techniques from these books, mixed with some others that Matthew's taught me many, many years ago, to make our patterns. Okay? We're not going to be using all the techniques from these books. We're not going to be using some of the shaping techniques and stuff like that, because those are a little bit more advanced than this class. Maybe if this class goes well, and you know, we'll do another class on the shaping techniques, which are a lot of fun and really, really cool. <laughs> these two books, um, really honestly, these are probably the greatest resource for late period um, costume design and you know, and making late period clothes that is out there. Um, they're brand new. Uh, this one I just got, like, literally came out a month ago. I think I just got it two weeks ago. <laughs> so, yeah, I haven't even had a chance to go through the second volume yet. The first one, you know, I've gone through it, and it's, like, it's actually signed by Matthew. <laughs> I actually got the, 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 I was lucky enough to learn underneath Matthew when he lived in, in Arizona for, like, six to eight months. I went over to his house, and he just taught me so much that uh, I was able to, you know, learn and make, take my craft from here to here. And um, that's why, you know, I love his books. And, you know, he taught me um, something known as the Sarter system, which is the original drafting system that he used. I don't know if this book is actually available. 
Um, those of you who have Google food can try and look it up. It's the Sartre system by Robert Trump. Uh, but uh, uh, Robert Trump, uh, Robert was a mathematician who uh, took 50 years of measurements from the army and was able to create a system of e math equations to derive all the measurements you may need to make a pattern drafting block from four measurements. Height, chest, waist, and hip. From those four measurements, I can derive every other measurement I need to make a basic body block and make a doublet out of that. Uh, uh, the uh, pattern drafting method that we're going to be using to mix again between Matthew is essentially this. Okay, we're going to make a square. Okay, and this is what we call a body block. And on top of this body block, we will draft the pattern. Very very simple technique. It's connecting the dots, quite literally. Place a dot here. If you ever done graphing in school, it's the exact same thing. You're going to place a point there. You're going to place a point there. Put a ruler down, and you're going to draw a line. That's how hard this is going to be. It's connecting the dots. The, uh, the system that Matthew uses actually uses no math. Okay, so yes, the, the Sartre system is very math heavy. I have an Excel spreadsheet that does all the math for me now, so don't worry about it. <laughs> but Matthew's system uses something very similar to this, only without math. And in fact, we won't even be using tape measures. Um, we'll be using the period technique of using a ribbon to take the measurements and, you know, use that. It's a lot of fun. You got to do it. <laughs> um, all right. So that's, you know, the books I would suggest you look for. And if you can get them, they're great. They're a great resource to have. Okay? What we're going to do right now is talk about tools. What tools do you need to make a period doublet? Well, Obviously, you need a sewing machine, unless you want to hand sew everything. I am a lazy person by nature. I do some hand sewing, whatever hand sewing I feel is necessary on a garment, but in the end, I'd rather use a sewing machine for most of the construction. Why? Because, you know what, people don't see those inside seams. And <laughs> it's just easy enough to get them through. All you need is a simple machine. Okay? You do not need a $3,000 fancy machine that has 50 different stitches on it and can do, you know, 100 different things including check your email, okay? This is a very simple, basic, Singer Scholastic model machine. Unfortunately, they don't make this model anymore, but they do have something very similar that Steven owns. It's called a Heavy Duty. Is it? Is that it? Yeah. The Heavy Duty series. Um, it was what, $150? Yeah, you can yeah. get it on sale. You, you can get it on sale for $150. It does a straight stitch, it does a zigzag, and a buttonhole. That's all you really need to do any kind of construction for really any period. So you don't need a fancy machine that does a lot of different things. This machine, uh, the nice thing about this machine and the Heavy Duty series is it has all metal gears on the inside. It may sew a little bit slower than some of the other machines because it is all metal gears, but you can ram through just about everything <laughs> as you sew. I have sewed 18 layers of fabric through this machine. <laughs> yeah, I had to hand crank it, but it survived. <laughs> so, you know, so I have sewn leather on this machine as well. And so, um, and it has done well. I've had this machine for 15 years. Yeah, 15 years, it's been serviced like four times. I know I should do a better job of servicing it, but... <laughs> um, but yeah, so it, it, it puts up with all the punishment I give it, and I don't even really clean it regularly like I should. So, <laughs> yeah, so this machine, you know, th there's a reason why this and this, the Heavy Duty series are such great machines for schools, because they get punished, they put up with the punishment and everything else like that. So really honestly, if you're gonna get a machine, these are one of the ones to get. Are there other good machines out there? Yes, there's plenty of other good machines out there. If you decide you want to go online and purchase a machine and you're not sure you, you, know, you want it, you know, send me a link to the machine. I'll take a look at it and tell you, yes, give me my opinion on it. Uh, you know, it's just my opinion. You know, I don't know many, much about many other machines aside from this one. 
you know, because I like it, so that's the one I've used. The other machine that is very handy to get and very useful is something known as an interlock or a serger machine. All right. I don't use these machines for construction. Some people use these machines to construct garments. I use these machines to save my fabric. Okay. Fabric is made out of threads, and threads fray, as you can tell with this piece. Okay. This piece got washed, and the edge was not surged. This used to be one complete piece of fabric, and that's what happens to it. It frays. Fabric is woven, so that's what happens to it. A serger will lock the edge of the fabric, and I, as I pass around, as we go through the fabric, you'll see some of the edges have been surged, and what that does is it prevents it from fraying. What that means is that after your garment is made, it will last, and last, and last, and last, and last. I think the, the doublet that got passed around, uh, all the edges are surged on that, or at least some, most of them are. Um, that garment is quite literally 25 years old, okay? And it has been washed lots of times. I make my stuff so that it can be machine washed, okay? You can wash it in any old washing machine. You know, if you choose your right fabrics, you prep them the right way, you can do that. Yeah, you don't need to dry clean it. Again, I sweat in my stuff. I white in my stuff. It needs to be able to be just thrown in the machine and washed. And so that's the way I, I make my stuff. There are some outfits I have that I don't wash because the fabrics I chose to make those out of, you know, can't be washed. Well, those are the fabrics that, those are the ones I don't fight in. I just walk around and look pretty. So, <laughs> so you know, the fabrics you choose will determine what you could do with it, but you know, I'll show you how to prep fabrics and how to test them to see if maybe, yeah, you can just wash it in the machine. Using a serger helps it last through the machine washings. I have doublets that I've made that, you know, unfortunately I don't fit in anymore, <laughs> that are 20 years old. That I made, the you know, first time I met Matthew, actually about 15 years ago. Um, you know, and... They have been washed hundreds of times, worn by you know me and different people, and they still survive. They're still put together and they're not falling apart. So, you know, if you if you make it right, it will last. So, you know, that's what a serger does, and that's why I use one on basically every garment I make. Okay, uh, these machines are a little bit more expensive, but you can find cheaper ones. I, I this is a, a Husqvarna. We got it because it was available. Um, as far as sergers go, uh, as it says, it's a, if it's if it's a serger, it's usually pretty good. <laughs> uh, Stephen, how much did you pay for your serger? One hundred fifty. Again, one hundred fifty. So you can find them out there for around one hundred fifty dollars, and it, you've got a decent one. So it, yeah, it, uh, Amazon sales whenever yeah. they do Cyber Monday. Yeah. And all that. So machines. Good thing to get, you know, and those are the two machines I use, okay? <clears throat> this table is also a wonderful purchase. You can get these tables at Joann's, um, and if you get them with the 50% off coupon, they're much cheaper. <laughs> so find them, you'll, you'll get them on one of those days where you get them for the 50% off coupon. Again, I think they're around $150 with the 50% off coupon. How much are they? They're 50 with the... Uh, um, and this is a these the, these sides actually collapse on it. It obviously rolls around. And the nice thing about this is I can work on this, and my back doesn't hurt. Okay, <laughs> you can use a fold-up table, but that recently was on sale for super cheap. Yeah, like, um, <laughs> it comes in pieces. You have to put it together, but it's a great table to use. Um, um, so, I would suggest getting one of these tables if you can't afford it, okay? Uh, tape measure, obviously, uh, if you want to use, you know, measuring tape to take you know, measurements, you can get one of those. You can get one of the little plastic ones. I forgot to bring mine today. There's the one thing I forgot anything about. Other things we'll need for drafting patterns, okay? A yardstick. 
I like the metal ones because, uh, you know, I, I think they work better. But if you want to use a wood one, you can use a wood one. It doesn't matter. But a standard yardstick is great. The other thing, this is my, I use one of these endlessly. This is my favorite tool for patterning and for cutting out fabric and everything else like this. This is an embroider or a quilting ruler. That's all it is, is a quilting ruler. You can find it in the quilting section of any uh, sewing, you know, anywhere they sell craft and sewing supplies. It is clear for a reason and it is very useful as you will see when we are, you know, laying out our patterns and everything else like that. They, they come in 18 inch varieties. I think you can get them longer, but the 18 inch one is all you will really need. The other nice thing is it's flexible for measuring around corners and that will be useful when we do it. So definitely you will need one of these. These curved rulers are nice uh, for drawing curves. Yeah, but I will show you methods in which you can use your wrist and elbow as a compass basically. So you won't need a compass per se. You know, one of these curved rulers is nice, but yeah, this is not absolutely necessary, but they are helpful and useful. Again, you will find these mostly in the embroidery, in the uh, quilting section um, of your fabric store. You can, you can go online and find them in you know, the quilting section, you know, of your like that. Okay. A large square is also useful. Again, I like the metal ones because you know, they're just easier to put down on things and, and they really don't change their dimensions very much. Uh, I prefer one without the little hole in the corner so that I can actually get a nice sharp corner there if I need it. This one's obviously got measurements on it as well and so that's also very useful. Your local hardware store has these. <laughs> or you can find them at an art store or something like that. You want a big one like this, okay? Uh, you can get a smaller one but the larger one will be needed to draw, of course, longer straight lines. You know, that kind of thing. So we did find a tape measure. Uh, obviously this is the one I keep here at the school. Uh, this is just your standard 60 inch long tape measure. These are great to get. They cost like two bucks at uh, Joanne's so, um, and they're very, very useful. All right. Uh, so when we talked about the rows, the other really you know, uh, things that you will need, a really good pair of scissors. Okay. Um, this, these are Fiskars. Uh, you can get the, we got these on Amazon. Uh, yeah. You want a, a good pair of scissors. Uh, there are lots of good pair of scissors. How much did you pay for these? $14. $15. So uh, don't go to Joanne's and buy the $2 scissors. <laughs> they, they will work for a little while, but these can actually be sharpened and, and everything else like that. You want a good, and you know, you don't want, you know, you want something that's comfortable in your hand, um, but you also don't want something that's too short. You need to be able to make long, smooth cuts. So uh, there are lots of good scissors out there, um, and you know you can talk to other sewing people, and they will help you find good scissors. If you do get a pair of scissors, remember there are two. You need two pairs: one for cutting fabric and one for cutting paper. Do not mix them up. Make sure the handles are different colors, or that you have some way to mark the scissors so that you do not use the fabric scissors for paper. As soon as you use the fabric scissors on paper, they're now paper scissors. <laughs> the scissors, the paper will dull the scissors to a point that they will not be useful for cutting fabric. Okay? Another neat little useful tool is, is this little device. It, again, uh, you get these at Joann's in the quilting section or in the notion section. And it's for pulling cording through casings. Uh, these are extremely useful. Uh, I don't know what they call them, but they're very, very nice. So, and, and they, they will be a, a good seam ripper will be necessary because guess what? You will screw up at some point, and you will need a seam ripper to take out the seam you just sewed, um, and so you can resew it. Uh, they, these are very useful. They come in many different varieties. There are, yeah, they're pretty much six and one half dozen, I don't know which one you get, but you will need a, a seam ripper at some point to get one. Uh -huh. uh, masking tape is very nice. This here is a marking tool, okay? 
Inks come in many different varieties. They have chalks, uh, you have pencils, and everything else like that. This particular one has a little wheel in it, and I'm just going to make a little mark here. You can see it made a nice little line on my jacket, and then, oh look, it just erases because it's just chalk. Uh, again, the quilting section. <laughs> you can get these in the quilting section. They're very useful. They come with refills that you can just pour chalk in and refill it. Uh, you can get them in different colors. Uh, this one happens to be yellow. As most of the fabrics I deal with are dark. Um, I gotta get some more blue so I can use it for, use it for white and I gotta get another one so that I can use it for that. But uh, these, are, this is by far the best fabric marker I have ever found. They make nice sharp lines and they're easy to, you know, if you make a mistake you can just brush it off and move on. I've seen people use pencils, I've seen people use Sharpies, uh, I've seen people use uh, Taylor's chalk, which is usually the little square pieces of chalk. Um, you have the chalk pen pencils that work pretty good too. I find these work better than anything else. It's a nice smooth line along the fabric and it's, it's very, very useful. You will need this when we are cutting out your pattern. When we're cutting the fabric, you know, for your pattern. So, um, this is, you know, fabric markers are great, and this is the best one I've ever found. Are these that are used for quilting? Uh, paper. Uh, we're, I, I will be providing all the paper that is necessary for the patterns. Okay. Um, I, I, uh, I know which paper to buy on Amazon. It's a lot easier to make. But basically, you need wide paper. Now this one I bought at uh, Office Max you know, in the art section. Um, you know, it's a nice 48 inch wide piece of uh, paper, but it's only 12 feet long. So it's 4 feet wide and 12 feet long. You'll be able to get one, maybe two or three patterns out of this. Okay, And that'll be it. The rest of it you won't really be able to use. I bought this stuff on Amazon, it's dual finish lightweight paper. It's just plain old brown butcher block paper. A hundred feet of it in this box, and it's 36 inches wide. Yeah, so I mean, this I've already made 17 patterns out of this, and there's still plenty of it left. So, this is a great buy. I'm going to be buying another box of this on Amazon. I know exactly what I ordered, so I'll be able to buy another one. But yeah, you, you want to use some kind of good, sturdy paper. I have heard of people using wrapping paper for patterns. Problem I have with wrapping paper is it disintegrates too easy. It's made to be torn, you know, and so it's usually very, very thin. Uh, most store-bought patterns that you get use very, very thin paper. Uh, that's why I like using this paper here. Um, and so this is what we will be using to make our patterns. You know, it's actually, you can iron it, where it irons out very good. <laughs> I did not bring my ironing board and my iron with me, but you know, that, you know, any old ironing board and iron you will need at some point. Um, I use the iron to press the fabric and to press open seams and to make cutting the pattern out much easier. So, you know, we will be having a couple irons in here when we get to that point. Huh? All right, so. That's it for pretty much the tools. Oh, and hand sewing needles. That's what I forgot. And my hand sewing needles. There we go. Simple and hand sewing needles. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, a pink cushion. <laughs> Very useful. Now, mine's a unique shape, uh, you know, but you, know, you can get the typical tomato pin cushions. They're great. Uh, you know, they, have nice, they usually have sand in them for sharpening the points of the pins as you go along. And so these, you know, a pin cushion, a good pin cushion is nice. Uh, a thimble will be needed for when we do hand sewing. Now, the most of the thimbles that you see out there are like this. They have a solid top, okay? Um, I don't use this type of thimble. Okay? This thimble is made to be used by pushing with the tip of your finger as you sew, okay? I use a tailor's thimble. As you can see, there is no top to this, you know? Uh, you had to find, I had to find it online, okay? Uh, sometimes you can find them at Joann's, but a nice part about this is I can sew 
and I push the needle with the side of my finger as a technique I'll show you as we sew and it's a much more easy way to hand sew. So we will be doing some hand sewing. I'll te be teaching you a couple of basic stitches for the hand sewing and you know so we'll be using those as we sew. As for needles go, I prefer short, fat, big eyed needles. Uh, stuff that you use for chenille or tapestry. Okay? Those are the type of needles you will need. Okay? I was told, as far as the history of sewing goes, way back in the 16th century, that there was a tailor's guild and that the dressmaker's guild broke off from the tailor's guild. A dressmaker's guild uses, you know, designed the techniques that is used primarily in fabric construction nowadays. Tiny, thin needles pushed with the tip of the fingers between the, the threads. Okay? Tailors, back in the day, would take the biggest, fattest needle they could probably force through the fabric, and they'd just punch it through. Okay? <laughs> yeah. And so that's what I do. It's a lot easier, and, and I don't break as many needles. So, you know, uh, embroidery needles work, but they don't have a sharp enough point on them that I have found. And the nice thing about a needle with a big, fat eye on it, it's real easy to, to thread it. So, you know, so those are the type of, you know, hand sewing needles and stuff like that. Um, we'll probably get into using some um, beeswax and stuff like that when we hand sew off. We'll talk about that as we go along. Okay. So that's basically the tools we'll be using. And, oh, of course, thread. I'm sorry. Other things. <laughs> thread. Um, the main thread I use is the standard dual duty uh you know, I think it's a poly cotton mix. Yeah, this one's 100% poly polyester. You know, thread I use is you know just the easiest all-purpose thread that you can get at Joann's or you know Walmart or anywhere else that they, they sell thread. You can use cotton thread. I find cotton thread breaks too easy. Uh, I don't like using cotton thread. If you want to use silk thread. More power to you. <laughs> Linen thread binds in the machine. This all-purpose polyester stuff, yes, it's polyester. But the fact of the matter is it's on a very small area of your doublet, and it will it's the strongest, easiest stuff to use. So I use, you know, polyester thread. As far as buying thread that exactly matches your, your fabric, you don't need that. Most of the thread will be hidden. And so you won't really see it. So, you know, I use primarily black and white thread. I use white threads for lighter fabrics and black threads for darker fabrics. Once in a while, there's a part of the doublet that needs a, a matching thread, and I will use that. But for the most part, I use that's what I do. So uh, if you want to buy a matching thread, go, go, by all means, go ahead and do that. But it's not absolutely necessary. Okay. Fabric. Fabric is probably going to be the most important thing to your doublet. The fabric you choose will make a difference between whether the doublet is comfortable and whether it is washable and you know, how usable it is. Okay? And so what I'm going to expect of you, I'm going to talk about fabric today, is for you to obtain some kind of fabric to make your doublet. Uh, before we talk about the types of fabric, we're going to talk about fabric itself. Okay? Fabric is a woven material. Okay? And what that means is you have threads going two different directions. Okay? You have threads going up and down. Okay? And you have threads that are going across. Okay? See if I remember this correctly. <laughs> The up and down grain is the warp. warp, thank you. The cross grain is the weft. I always get those confused, so, you know, I hope they are not alone. Now, most fabrics are not a straight weave. And what I mean by straight weave is that, you know, this thread goes over this one and then under this one and then over that one and then under that one. You know, just up and down, up and down. Most fabrics are not woven like that because they're woven by machine and that's very, very expensive and very, very hard to do. Most fabrics achieve, you know, where they will go over two, under two, over two, under two. 
some of them more so than others. Um, you know, and the strength of your fabric depends on this weave. And there's also twill weaves and net we and knit weaves and you know, this, that, the other thing. Um, satin weaves are very interesting because they go over like seven threads and then under one and then over seven and then under one. That's why satin fabrics tend to be real easy to, to tear because there's not a lot of strength in there, but they're very smooth and shiny. You know? So you know, different weaves will produce different strengths of fabric. So will the threads that are used to weave that fabric. Um, this means that you know, you know how strong your 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 doublet is, and whether or not it can put up with the punishment that you're going to put it through. If it's a rapier legal doublet, means that you have to find the right fabrics to do so. We're going to discuss the different kinds of fabric. Uh, the other, there is one more direction on fabric, and that is called the bias. The bias is the direction that runs along the angle between the warp and the weft, okay? This will be very important. Fabric generally stretches along the bias, okay? When purchasing fabrics for doublets, I like fabric that stretches the least amount possible, okay? So along the warp and along the weft, I shouldn't have a lot of stretch. In other words, knit fabrics are not good, okay? Along the bias, though, you will always have a little bit of stretch. And we actually use the physics of that stretch to put in the right places to make our doublet stronger and more useful. We'll talk you know, about how to place pattern pieces on fabric when we get to that point. So you know, when choosing your fabric, it's nice to be able to handle it so you can feel this, you know, how much stretch is in it. Okay, and also to feel what we call the weight of the fabric. The weight of the fabric is basically how thick it is. Okay. Heavier fabrics are hotter usually. Okay. Lighter fabrics are usually more comfortable, but lighter fabrics are usually also weaker. Okay. So depending on what you're going to do with it depends on what you need to do. So, you know, thinking about this, you know, that's going to help us when we talk about the different fabric choices over here. I'm gonna... So, there are two different kinds of fabric families, basically. You have natural fibers, and you have, you know, basically non-natural fibers, okay? I don't like to say man-made or, or, or natural fibers, because there are some natural fibers out there that are man-made, and they actually work pretty good, okay? So, um, you know, our natural fibers are things like, obviously, cotton, okay, linen, silk, and wool. But also falling into this category is something called rayon, okay? And I left rayon down there because it's a little bit different. Cotton and linen are plant-based fibers, okay? Cotton obviously comes from the cotton plant. Linen comes from the flax plant, okay? The nice thing about these two is they breathe really nicely, and they're easy to work with, and they're readily available to most people, okay? Linen has become very, very popular in the last six or seven years, and so it's actually become more and more available, which is very nice. It's, when I first started sewing, you couldn't find linen. <laughs> yeah. Now it's everywhere, and it's awesome. Uh, silks are fantastic. Obviously, they come from you know, silkworms, um, and you know, it, it's a wonderful uh, fabric to use. problem is it tends to be a little bit expensive. It also tends to be a little bit difficult to wash. <laughs> so, yeah. There are some silks out there that you can get away with washing, um, but you know it is a protein-based fabric versus a you know plant-based fabric, um, and so it is very very nice to get. Wool also falls into that category of an animal-based fabric, a protein-based fabric, 
Uh, believe it or not, there are some really, really nice tropical weight wools out there that are perfect for our environment here in Louisiana. Wool is actually wonderful to wear when it's hot out because it, it, it soaks up all your sweat and then anytime there's a breeze, it's nice and cool. Uh, my wool doublet's actually one of my favorite things to wear on a nice warm day. And it's wool with linen you know, liner, so it, it, it is very nice, comfortable to wear. I've actually got a sample of some nice tropical weight wool out here. Um, the problem with wool, again, is its availability. Finding tropical weight wool is difficult at the Joann's. You're not going to find a lot of it. Um, you're going to have to go online and go shopping or find a specialty shop to find it. Uh, rayon is actually a man-made fabric. Okay? It's made from basically mulberry trees. Okay? Yeah. Uh, it's made to emulate silk. Silk is formed by silkworms who eat mulberry and then produce silk. Okay? Mm -hmm. Basically, rayon is man skipping the silkworm, you know, silk, silkworm step. Okay? Uh, rayon is usually, it's a little bit stronger usually than standard silk. It doesn't have quite the same feel to it. Um, I don't think it breathes quite as easily as silk, but it is a little bit stronger. It's used a lot in what we call, oh, uh, uh, words escaping me, where they take two different fabrics and weave them together. <laughs> yeah. But, anyway. Brocade or a jacquard? No, uh, just a blended fabric. Oh. Just a blended fabric, a fabric blend, that's it. You know. Uh, fabrics come in three types. A hundred percent of one, you know, uh, usually of uh, one material, either natural or, or uh, unnatural material, or a blend of those. And sometimes the blend can be between two natural fibers. You'll see a lot of linen rayon blends out there. There's a ton of them. Or linen cotton blends because it's just cheaper to do that. Uh, you'll see a lot of hundred percent cotton or hundred percent linen. Uh, if it's got silk in it, it's usually just 100% silk. You know, they usually don't mix silk with anything else because it doesn't weave nice with other things. Um, but rayon works really well with linen or cotton. So you'll see a lot of blends out there. As long as it's mostly natural fibers, the fabric will breathe, meaning that it will be more comfortable to wear. Okay? Unnatural fibers, we'll put those over here. Okay? are man-made usually and made from products like petroleum or plastic, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, nylon is, is a very popular man-made fabric. Uh, what's the other one that everybody should know? Polyester. <laughs> polyester, that's it. I'm just you know, blanking on some stuff today. But polyester is probably the most popular non-man-made or you know non-natural fabric that you will find out there unfortunately a lot of fabrics out there are a mix between natural fibers and polyester um, the less polyester that's in something the better it is for you okay yes polyester is cheap and it makes the fabric cheap but it also makes the fabric you know nasty after a while and it just doesn't wash as well, in my opinion, and it doesn't move as well, and it doesn't breathe as well. Uh, polyester fabrics and everything else like that. We're going to talk a little bit about how to identify fabrics here in a second. Okay? So, uh, unnatural fabrics, you know, they're usually some kind of, you know, petroleum polymer, and you know, natural fabrics are the ones that you know come from plants and animals. Okay, natural fabrics better than unnatural fabrics. However, you got to go with what you can get, <laughs> you know, and sometimes the prettiest fabric or the fabric you really want is a polyester blend. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? If that's the case, use it. I have certainly that doublet I passed around earlier. There's a lot of polyester in that. I can already, I can tell you that much right now. So, you know, what you get and how you use it is completely up to you, okay? Now, for a period, the best fabric by far is linen. All right? Linen is 
really, honestly, in my opinion, the best fabric to use at all for period Elizabethan doublets. It's comfortable to wear, it's strong, it's durable, it's easy to work with, and it comes in a huge variety of colors, okay? Linen itself comes in several weights, okay? I'm gonna pass these around as we go along. Uh, first we have what's known as a handkerchief weight, and as you can see, I can essentially see through this, okay? Handkerchief weight linen is great for making shirts and undergarments, uh, lining on some things, but you know, as far as rapier doublets go, a handkerchief weight is really not what you want. Okay, handkerchief weight or lightweight linen is not really strong enough to make it. You know, you'll have to add more layers of this linen to make it strong enough to survive you know, a rapier punch test. Okay. This is a handkerchief weight linen. A medium weight linen is really what you're looking for. Now, when I pass this around, you'll be able to feel that this one's a little bit thicker. It feels a little bit heavier. You know? And when you look for it online, oh, by the way, you can tell the, these are surged edges as they're going along. <laughs> you'll see that what a surged edge looks like, too. A medium weight linen is exactly what you want when making a Elizabethan doublet. Okay? When you go online to you know, fabricstore.com or linens.com or whatever, it will be listed as a medium weight linen. And these fabrics that I'm passing around are 100% linen. Um, these are wonderful to use, and like I said, it really is the best one to use. The nice thing about a medium weight linen is with it you can essentially get away with two some you know three sometimes two layers of the linen when it's cut properly for your you know rape your legal doublet it will pass a punch test finally we have a heavyweight linen okay this is almost a canvas linen not quite but it is a heavier linen uh, one thing you'll notice about this linen as we pass it around, you'll see the edge is not searched. This one got washed without searching the edge. And so you'll see how much fray near it. Um, heavyweight linens are nice. Uh, they'll put up with a lot of punishment. You can certainly use only a couple layers and it will pass a punch test if, if uh, constructed properly. However, uh, it is warmer. You know, just like anything else, the heavier the fabric is, the warmer it gets. And you see that one actually thumps when it hits <laughs> the table. All right, so linen, probably the best thing, especially for lining the doublet, okay, which is the inner side of the doublet, the side people don't see. But lining the doublet, you definitely want to get some kind of linen, in my opinion, either a linen blend or a cotton blend, okay? If that is not available to you, um, what you're going to want to get is something known as broadcloth. Now, broadcloth is just simply cotton cloth. Now, this is a very thin one. This is a very lightweight one. Again, it's like handkerchief weight. But again, it's just, a, it's a, this one is, a, I believe, a cotton poly blend. But it's just, you know, it's quilting fabric. Uh, broadcloth, you will need more layers of it to make it rapier legal. Uh, there is something out there called trigger cloth or, or duck cloth. A lot of people use that. Not necessary to use that weight of fabric to pass a punch test. As we go along, we'll talk about construction and what we'll need to do to pass a punch test for SCA rape your legal doublets. Okay? This next piece I'm going to be sending around is a duck cloth or a canvas or a trigger cloth. It's a very heavy duty fabric. This fabric is hot, okay? The problem with the heavier cottons is it gets too hot and everything else like that. Uh, so, you know, what we can do, you know, is, you know, again, pass this one around. Got it. Okay. So, that again, you know, these are just basically lining fabrics. Uh, the next two coming around, these are going to be actually linen blends, okay? They are mostly linen, um, but they're nice medium weight blends. They, they have some cotton in them, I believe, and, you know, we'll go from there on it, okay? So, again, you can find lots of good fabrics out there and that kind of thing. So, for your lining, 
what you're looking for is linen and stuff like that. I'll pass this one around too. This is a flat sheet. <laughs> you can buy these at Walmart. I use these to make what we call mock-ups, which is we'll take your pattern after we make it, we'll cut out, you know, and see how well it fits using a mock-up. These cost like three bucks at Walmart, and you can get you know two or three mock-ups from each sheet. So uh, please go out and purchase a queen size flat sheet of your choice to make your mock-up. I don't suggest using these for anything but mock-up patterns. They're almost always a polyester cotton blend, mostly polyester, and they're you know unless you get the high thread count, and I wouldn't do that for a mock-up. <laughs> But it is a good, easy way to get some cheap fabric. Okay, it's just a flat sheet. So, and that last one I'm going to send around is a lining fabric. This one is actually uh, uh, again a poly cotton blend. And the interesting thing about this one is it actually has a little bit more stretch to it than some of the ones I've sent around before. I think this. Is, yeah, this is it. Yeah. So if you play with it and you you can play with the stretch and you can see how it stretches different from some of the other fabrics I've sent around. Again, this was mostly a polyester. Um, I have used it to make socks and stuff like that, and it's very comfortable for socks. So that's the lining. That's the things people are not going to see. Now we're going to talk about what we call the fashion fabric, or the fabric that goes on the outside, what people are going to see. You can use linen for a fashion fabric. It was very popular in period to make garments out of linen, and linen looks fantastic, especially if you embellish it right, for a fashion fabric. So if you want to use 100% linen on all the layers of your, your doublet, that would be great. Now when I'm talking about layers of the doublet, a doublet itself usually has at minimum two layers. An outer fashion layer, that's the layer people see, and then an inner lining, Okay, to line it. If you've ever seen a suit coat, suit coat has like a satin lining on the inside, and then the outside is usually wool or some other kind of fabric. Same kind of concept when building a doublet. When we make it rapier legal, we add usually at least one or two more layers of fabric in there so that it will pass the punch test um, as <coughs> defined by the rules of the SCA. The, you know, and so that makes the double a little bit heavier. And again, you can use linen on every layer if you really want to. You can use trigger cloth on every layer if you really want to. But, yeah, but I like to make myself pretty. And so I like to use linen on most layers and then some kind of fashion fabric to make it look pretty. There's lots of fabrics you can choose for a fashion fabric. Um, some things I would not choose. We're going to start with those, okay? All right, this is tent canvas, okay? This is not good for anything <laughs> as far as garment construction goes. It's been treated for putting on tents. It's waterproof. It's, you know, it's uh, bi microbiology proof, all that kind of mold proof. And it's not really good for using on anything but tents. So try to avoid that. Uh, the next two fabrics are, this is a fleece fabric, okay? You'll find this a lot. It's called polar fleece or fleece. Um, these are wonderfully soft and comfortable fabrics. They're also very, very hot. You can see this guy. This is great. I've used these for inner linings of coats and cloaks. It's great for that. But if you want to put this on a doublet, you will die of heat frustration, okay? So don't use a fleece fabric, but they are fun and, you know, and they're usually fairly cheap, and, but you don't want to use them. Uh, another fabric, the next fabric, this is a felt, okay? Felt fabrics, um, felt fabrics are not really woven, they're more pressed into, into being. And again, they're very warm. Uh, they, this is almost a wool felt, I'll have to you know, do a test on it here in a second to, to really tell. But again, you know, it, it's not a great fabric for using for double construction because it tends to fall apart and you know, it just is not very comfortable. Terry cloth, it's great for bath towels and bathrobes. 
and not great for double construction. <coughs> Again, you're talking about a very warm, very moisture absorbing fabric and, and it's not something that you really want to use for double construction. Uh, you can make wonderful shower robes out of it and you know it's a great little thing to have for going to and from the shower. This is a piece of what we call quilted fabric. Um, you'll find this in most of your fabric stores. It's a layer of some kind of fashion, usually a cotton print with a layer of cotton batting or you know, polyester batting in the middle, usually with some kind of lining. This one happens to be mostly polyester in all three layers. Um, I have made some pieces of rapier fighting you know, with this fabric. Usually the coif that I wear is made out of this fabric. It adds a little bit of extra padding and stuff like that. However, the main doublet's not a good thing to use for constructing doublets. Um, this is a piece of gingham. <laughs> yeah. It's very thin, see-through fabric. It's 100% polyester. They use this a lot in wedding dresses, usually for the underdress to provide floof and everything else like that. Again, not great fabric for you know, using for a doublet. Okay. And I know, you know, most of these seem pretty obvious so far, but now we're going to get to something that's not so quite obvious. This is a fabric that's known as ultra suede. Okay? It's also known as faux suede. Okay? It is a man-made fabric meant to resemble well, suede. Okay? Um, they're usually almost 100% polyester. Okay? They're really hard to sew. <laughs> You know, and so it's a lot like sewing leather. Um, it doesn't fray at all, but you know, trying to get a needle through it is, is just a pain. And these are hot, 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 hot to wear because these do not breathe at all. This is a lot like wearing a plastic bag. Okay? They're wonderful to feel. They have great colors. Um, they're actually fun to work with. I've actually got a couple outfits made out of faux suede. But... Not the best fabric in the world. Oh, we'll get to that later. Uh, probably the one that, that most people pick that is probably one of the worst choices for fabric is something known as chenille. Okay? Chenille fabric, C-H-E-N-I, I think it's two L's and an E. <laughs> um, looks pretty. I mean, this, this fabric is gorgeous. Okay? Uh, sometimes it has uh, fuzzy little pieces on it, like this one does. Um, uh, or, you know, sometimes it has nice little swirl marks, like this one does. These are great fabrics for upholstering a couch. Um, they're wonderful fabrics for making cloaks out of, uh, or coats. But for making a doublet, they are very hot, very warm. And the problem with chenille fabric is no matter how many times you wash it, it will still shrink. Chenille is a very loosely woven fabric, and every time you wash it, those weaves tighten up, and then tighten up some more, and then tighten up some more. I had a doublet I made out of a, just a gorgeous chenille doublet. It was gorgeous chenille diamond fabric. It was very, very pretty. After I washed it two times, it didn't fit, and no, I didn't gain weight. You could see how much the lining was actually folding over the doublet because the lining didn't shrink with the doublet itself. So yeah, chenille fabrics are wonderful. They look pretty, but they are not very good for construction purposes. And uh, for those of you who know Mark or Rory, they were the ones who chose a chenille fabric for their rapier fighting outfit. They regret that decision. They, every time I hear them, it's, oh, it's so hot in here. Well, you chose the fabric. I can't help you there, okay? Now, some satins are very, very pretty, okay? And can make for a good-looking doublet. Again, the problem with satin is it tends to be a very loose weave, um, and it tends to be lots of polyester in there. There are silk satins out there. There are some, you know, cotton satins out there. Yeah, there are some really nice man, you know, natural fiber satins out there. The problem with satin is the weave it makes. Now, satin usually has this kind of shiny appearance, 
but uh, it can come in many different shapes and forms. This is a gorgeous one, by the way. I really like this one. It's great for embellishments. Uh, it's not so great for the actual body of the doublet. Okay? Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to send around several samples here. This one I consider it a satin, even though it's got you know, some nice little uh, bumpy little things on it. But again, yeah, these are fabrics that are okay, <laughs> but not really useful. This one that I'm going to send around is actually something known as antique satin. Okay. Um, the interesting thing about it is, is it, it's one color on this side and it's nice and shiny, and on the other side it's kind of a flat, different color. <laughs> you know? You'll see these often, they'll be gold on one side and blue on the other, or red on one side and yellow on the other, and stuff like that. This one, I didn't have a good sample of it, but this is the best sample I had. Again, this is a really nice fabric, it looks really pretty, it's great to work with and everything else like that, but again, it tends to be very, very warm and not breathe. You know, I'll get embellishments. It's wonderful. The fabric itself, or the, the double itself, not so great. Okay. Uh, so do we have anything else that you should? Oh yeah. <laughs> the last thing, and probably the thing that yeah most people hate when I say it shouldn't be used. <laughs> Velvet. Okay. Velvet is that fabric that you go in the store, in the fabric store, and you like to pet because it's all fuzzy. And, you know, and it feels soft. And I will say, without regret, I made my first, like, four or five doublets out of velvet. Okay? Why? Because I was single and all the girls would come up in pets. Okay? <laughs> Velvet's a wonderful fabric. And it comes in many, many different shapes. This is a gorgeous, you know, and, you know embellished velvet. You know, and, and this would make a, a wonderful, you know, you know, doublet. It would look awesome. I mean, it would just look so pretty and it would look smashing from a distance and everything else like that. You would die. Okay? <laughs> it is, again, velvet's a very hot, very heavy fabric. It doesn't breathe. Most of them have some kind of polyester to them and everything else like that. This one here is a straight velvet that's going to be coming around. Uh, these are great for skirts. They flow real nice. Now, the nice thing about velvet is it has a wave to it. It flows so nicely. Cloaks, coats, things like that that, that you want to be warm are great to be made out of velvet. Um, if you get a nice stretchy velvet, tights can be made out of velvet. And it's a lot of fun if you're a nice single guy again. <laughs> but it, it's not so great for making doublets. This last one I'm going to send around is actually what they call a cut velvet. As you will see, it actually has a design cut into the, the, the velvet itself. Again, these are gorgeous, and they look really pretty, and you're like, oh, I like that, because it will just look fantastic. But again, especially in our Louisiana heat, you will die, okay? You will suffer, and you, you, will, you, know, you will suffer for your beauty, but you know, that's what it is. You will suffer for the beauty of it, okay? So that's fabrics well you really, really shouldn't use, okay? You know, they're gorgeous, they're pretty, but you know, while pretty fabric, you want to look good. And I, I'm the last person that says you shouldn't look good on the field because the first thing I want to do when I go on the field is look better than anybody else. But really, honestly, function has to come before... The, the look, okay? It has to be comfortable to wear for long periods of time. It has to be comfortable to fight in. It has to be washable. It has to be cool and easy to use. So fabrics that fall into that, you know, are there are many different kinds. You know, and some of the ones I'm going to show you, you know, kind of contradict what I just sent around. Okay, especially the first <laughs> one. This is an embroidered satin. Okay, I think this one's actually a silk blend. Okay, it's actually uh, can be actually even be called a taffeta. Okay, um, this is a gorgeous fabric, and this is something I would be willing to make the sacrifice to wear on the field because it is so pretty. Okay, it's got that nice reflective quality to it. 
Um, it's a slightly different color on the inside. It's got that, those blue woven threads throughout it, and it's, it's embroidered. Yes, it's machine embroidery, but it looks awesome. And, but it's light enough that I would be willing to put it on <laughs> as a fashion accessory. So sometimes it's okay to be a little warm to look good because this one I would definitely use in a heartbeat. <laughs> okay. Leather can be used and is another natural fiber that can be used for making um, doublets. Okay. This first one I'm going to send around is what we call a material weight suede leather. Okay? It's suede on one side and it's a standard leather on the other. It's material weight because it's actually very, very light. Uh, I can't remember what the ounce weight of it is, but it's a very, very light, very thin. It could actually be sewn through most machines. If you're going to make a doublet out of leather, please remember, since it's leather, it will be hot. It will also be stronger than a lot of fabrics, and so you really probably won't have to line it much. But it will be hot. But sometimes, again, a little bit of sacrifice is good to look good. Uh, leather is great for embellishments. Uh, I wouldn't wear it you know, as the entire doublet. But that's a machine weight, or uh, a uh, fabric weight leather coming around. This next sample, this is a regular standard leather that you use to make belts and collars and stuff like that. It's actually the leather I make my provost collars out of. Uh, this is not what I would suggest making a doublet out of. Because again, this will be like wearing a leather jacket while fencing. You know, it will just be plain hot. So, light material weight leather, I say yes, go for it. It'll be nice. It's not going to be too hot because it's lighter weight. Heavy weight leather for making belt, no. Okay, don't do that. Silk is wonderful. And it's great. And it's easy to use and it tends to put up with a lot. And it looks great when it's on. The problem with silk is it's usually expensive. Okay, uh, the first sample I'm going to send around is a, is a sample of what we call Dupiani silk. Um, this stuff has been tested. You can get away with two layers of Dupiani silk for your rapier doublet, and it will pass a punch test. I know people who have made shirts, just t-shirts out of Dupiani silk, and that's what they wear as their rapier armor. Okay, if you want to go that route, I can certainly help you out. But, um, again, it's expensive. Okay, and since it's silk, it's not going to last very long. Yes, the, uh, <laughs> the problem with silk is it does degrade as the more you wash it, and if you're wearing it as a t-shirt, guess what? You're going to be washing it a lot because they get sweat and that's it. But there is some silk out there that comes very nicely embroidered. Um, we found this silk at a, at a shop, and you know, you've seen you, know, Michelle, and I wear these you know, coats. They're just fantastic, and you know, it's wonderful, wonderful fabric. I'm going to be making myself a doublet out of this fabric very, very soon because I still have a whole bunch of it, so, <laughs> and I love it, love it, love it. All right, so silk is a great, great fabric. Okay, well, let's say you can't afford silk. Okay, you really can't afford a lot. That's fine. This is printed cotton, okay? I'm gonna send her out this, this piece of printed cotton fabric, okay? From this distance, who can tell it's printed cotton? <laughs> Not many of you, okay? It looks fantastic. It's got a wonderful design on it. If you find the right printed cotton, it can make a wonderful looking doublet. And once it's all sewn up, especially if you embellish it a little bit, it can be very nice. And since it's cotton, it will breathe, and it will be light, and it will be comfortable, okay? Uh, I actually used this as a lining on somebody's outfit. It was uh, on a cassock where the lining would actually be seen, and so this is a wonderful little bit of color flash. You know, I love printed cottons. They work really, really well. You know, you don't have to be 100% period on what everything you do, okay? Uh, as I said earlier, wool, if you find the right weight, it can be wonderful. This first wool I'm going to send around is a light tropical weight wool. This piece of fabric is actually a piece of hand-woven fabric, okay? 
This is very expensive. But uh, you can find tropical weight wools that are not very expensive. Uh, but this one is, is very nice. I'm working on a doublet for Michelle with this doublet. The other piece I'm going to send around is a piece of felted wool. This actually comes from a wool blanket that was washed. We took a wool blanket, we threw it in the washer and the dryer, and we made felted wool out of it. Um, I have a doublet that's made out of this. You guys may have seen it. The strap work doublet that I wear all the time is made out of this fabric. Now, it is a little warm, but again, sacrifice a little heat for fashion, I'll do it. Uh, but again, I, I have a doublet made out of a very similar fabric to this one. And again, it's my favorite doublet to wear when it's warm or wet or anything. It's, it's one of my favorite doublets to wear, period. All right. All right, so the... Final <laughs> category of fabric, or you know, we, get the, we got a couple of linens here. So, uh, what I'm passing around now are a couple embroidered fabrics. One's an embroidered cotton fabric, the other one's an embroidered linen fabric. Embroidered fabric is nice, it makes really good looking doublets. And obviously, if you can find an embroidered linen or an embroidered cotton, I believe this linen is actually a linen blend. Uh, this is the, the material I made my vigil doublet out of, and I, I love fighting in it. It's a nice, comfortable doublet. Um, we have a couple of uh, middle-class outfits made out of this uh, embroidered, uh, I think it's a cotton blend. Yeah. And then uh, this is a, an embroidered fabric that we use for four-part on uh, Michelle's, one of Michelle's outfits. And this one's a polyester um, blend, you know, embroidered. Um, so embroidered fabrics, if you can find them, look great. I like to keep the design simple, but I mean, you can go for it, you know, and <laughs> find something you like. But again, think about the fabric it's embroidered on, okay? Think about what it's made of and that kind of thing. So the category that most people find fabrics in are what we call jacquards and brocades, okay? Jacquards and brocades are a family of fabrics that are very similar to each other. And most people get them mixed up. Jacquard is spelled J-A-Q-U-A-R-D. Okay? Uh, um, brocade is B-R-O-C-H-A-D-E. Okay? Jacquard and brocade fabrics are the fabrics you see me wear most of the time. Okay? They're easy to find. Uh, they're generally poly cotton blends. And they generally look really, really pretty. And nice thing is they also wash very, very nicely. And they put up with a lot of punishment. So jacquard and brocade fabrics are very nice. Uh, the difference between a jacquard or a brocade can be difficult to tell. Right? First of all, we're going to start with a jacquard fabric. This is a jacquard fabric. Okay? You can see the design is on one side, but if I flip it over, you can't see the really the design. It's there, but it's not reversible, okay, is a great way to put it, okay? So a true, uh, a, a, a jacquard fabric, you'll see the design on one side, and usually it's woven into the fabric in some way, shape, or form, okay? On the other side, you won't see the same design, okay? I don't know how they do it. <laughs> it's something they do with the machines. Yeah, everybody else like that. But jacquard fabrics come in many different um, kinds. This is another kind of jacquard-like fabric. Hey, Dirk, this is your doublet. You know, I made Dirk a doublet out of this fabric. Okay, and it's a very nice fabric. I'm mean, sure Dirk is very comfortable. He made a really good choice on this fabric. He doesn't get overheated and everything else like that. It puts up with the washing and everything else like that. Again, this is just a different kind of jacquard style fabric. Jacquards don't have to be shiny. Uh, this one is technically a jacquard fabric. I use this one for embellishment all the time. And you can see <laughs> the back side looks nothing like the front side. Uh, this is almost could be uh, an embroidered fabric, but it's really not embroidered because the design is woven throughout the fabric, okay? So, um, brocade fabrics, on the other hand, tend to have the design on one side, and if you flip it over, well, it's the same design, it's just in the opposing colors. <laughs> yeah. So, they come in lots, again, lots of different shapes and sizes and stuff like that. I'm going to start passing this around. Look at them. 
This is a, a very popular brocade that you'll see. And you can see you can barely see the design from that distance. Um, but you know, if I flip it over, the design pops a little bit better. Uh, the neat thing about brocades, um, there is a right side and a wrong side. The right side of the fabric is usually the side you see. The wrong side is the side that gets hidden inside the fabric. Nice thing about brocades is you can make that choice for yourself. Whichever side you like better, you can use. Um, I like brocades. I get a lot of nice ones, and you can find them all over the place. Again, they're usually poly cotton blends of some sort, and that kind of thing. This one is also, um, I think this would be, I would consider this a jacquard style fabric. Again, it's a neat little swirl design, and on the inside you can see it, but it's just kind of woven through the fabric. So these again are just different kinds of fabric. Uh, the final two pieces of fabric are, are kind of popular styles of fabric that you will see um, used in a lot of doublets. Um, and what it is, is again, it's kind of like a mixture of uh, just a standard weave of a fabric with a little bit of, you know, weave going through it to pop a design, okay? What happens with these fabrics is you'll see on the back side, there's a lot of loose threads, okay? And some of you may be tempted to even use this side of the fabric for the doublet, Stephen. <laughs> His first doublet, he made that mistake. Uh, the problem with that is these loose threads do tear if you have them on the outside. On the inside, though, they put up with a lot. The nice thing about these styles of fabric is that they're really easy to embellish. Adding beads or, you know, you know little pieces of embroidery to it can be a lot of fun. Again, these are wonderful fabrics to work with. Uh, they're very popular. They're very easy to see out there. This uh, kind of you know, almost scale design, you'll see this a lot in a lot of different sizes and shapes and colors. It's very popular out there. They use these a lot for making couches and stuff like that. <laughs> but they're fantastic. And again, I, I really, I, you also see a diamond design. I have a couple of doublets with the diamond design on it. This is, again, a wonderful fabric for making stuff with and everything else like that. Now, you may be asking yourself, all right, I went to a garage sale or a Goodwill or whatever, and I found this fabric. How do I know what it's made out of? Okay? And that can be difficult to tell. Sometimes you can tell just by feeling it. If it feels oily, it's usually some kind of polyester fabric, okay? If it's got almost a, a wood smell to it, you can consider it probably a natural fiber, probably most likely a cotton or a linen, but it's difficult to tell. What you can do is something known as a burn test, okay? And that is where you actually take a small piece of the fabric, usually a one inch square, and we burn it. Okay, and from how it burns, you can tell whether it's a natural fiber or an unnatural fiber, okay, or even a blend, okay. Natural fibers, uh, especially our plant fibers, they will tend to catch fire even before the material gets too close to the flame, okay. They tend to light up pretty quick. When they burn, you'll actually see embers, okay? So they catch fire real quickly. So they, 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 they catch quickly, okay? When they burn, they tend to have embers. You can actually see the embers on them, you know, and it'll come off. So you'll see embers on them as they burn. They will burn completely, the plant fibers will. They will burn completely as they burn. So they'll burn off the whole piece. You'll be able to tell the difference between the cotton and linen, you know, you know, and that kind of thing by, by how it reacts after it's completely burnt. And they usually leave a gray ash, okay, and they have white smoke, okay? So when you burn it, that's how you can tell. For our protein-based uh, fibers, silk and wool, the most important thing to tell the difference between cotton and linen, again, they will catch 
fairly quickly. But they are also self-extinguishing. That's right. Once they start burning, that's a big word. Once they start burning, they will actually put themselves out. They won't continue to burn. So, you know, and usually the ash is more of a black bead that you can kind of crush, you know, and, you know, and that kind of stuff. But, you know, the most important piece is they're self-extinguishing. The rayon acts more like the plant fibers do because it is a plant-based fiber, so it acts like the plant fibers do, okay? The unnatural fibers, on the other hand, the biggest difference between these is instead of catching fire, they tend to melt away from the fire. They will actually kind of pull themselves and shrink away from the fire. Once they do catch, they usually kind of drip off like, like oil. <laughs> they leave little droplets everywhere. Don't let those things hit you, they burn. <laughs> you know? And you know, they, when they do finish burning, there'll be like a little black bead that's almost like a, like a glass bead. That's it. The other big thing is it's black smoke, okay? So, you know, if it's an unnatural fiber, that's what you will see. Now, there are videos on YouTube that you can go to, and they will actually burn the fiber. We're going to actually do a little experiment. We're going to burn some fabrics here in a second to, to kind of test some of the fabrics I brought in, okay? But, yeah, you can go on YouTube, and, yeah, you can... You know, find all kinds of neat little videos on you know, how to burn fabrics and everything else like that. They are actually pretty cool. And you know, they'll go into more detail than I have here on how to tell the difference. The hardest thing is when you get a blend between the poly and the natural fabrics. Because it will actually show you know, uh, you know, qualities of both. It will start off, it will burn quickly, but then you will see little fibers melting. It may have a little bit of black smoke. You know, and it'll have some gray ash and some black beads, depending on how much of each one is in there. If it's more unnatural, a higher concentration of the polyester, it'll show more of the polyester traits than it will the natural traits. Okay, so you uh, test your fabric. You know how you do that? You know, when you're in the store, you're like, oh, I really want to buy this. You know, pull a few threads out, go out in the parking lot, burn them, <laughs> see what they come out. And, and if it comes out, you know, like a natural fiber, yeah, go in and get it. Um, we used to, uh, when I lived in Phoenix, Arizona, there was a store called SAS Fabrics. They sold fabrics by the pound. Um, most of bolt ends and stuff like that. Yeah, these are, you know, fabrics that they got from just, you know, upholstery companies and stuff like that. You never knew what the contents of the fabric were. I always went in there with a little tiny pair of scissors, and I would cut off a little snip of fabric and go on the parking lot and burn it and figure out what it was before I bought it, you know because it, it, it makes sense. So if you don't know what you're buying, do a safe burn test. Again, watch the YouTube videos. They will show you how to do a burn test where it's safe. <laughs> you know, don't be burning huge squares of fabric. A one inch square is usually all you need to be able to tell what kind of fabric it is. But be careful when you're doing it. You don't want to burn down the house or anything. All right. So, that's pretty much what we're going to cover tonight. What I would like you to do, your homework, is to try and buy some fabric if you, if you don't already have some. If you do have some that you would like to use, um, you know, I, I think I have Charles's fabric still somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, please, you know, you know, you can bring it in, you know, and, and we'll take a look at it and say yes or no to it. That kind of thing. I would like you to try and get some fabric. You don't need it by next week. We probably won't be using it for a couple of weeks. So you have two or three weeks. I mean, you don't have to get it right away. In the next class, we're going to be starting to make our patterns. Okay, That's what we're going to start the next class. We're, we're going to take measurements, and we're going to start drafting patterns. That's what the next class is going to cover. Okay? So you, know, you don't need your fabric right away. The faster you get it, the better, because we can look at it and see if there's something wrong with it or whatever. Uh, we're also going to talk about how to treat your fabrics, you know, what to do to make it sure that when your doublet's done, it's washable. How much fabric to get? I'm sure that's, well, how much fabric do I get? Well, that's always a good question. Fabric comes in various widths. 
How wide the fabric is depends on how much you get. Generally, fabric comes in two widths, somewhere between 42 to 45 inches and somewhere between 54 to 60 inch wide fabric. Okay? In period, fabrics were around 28 inches wide. <laughs> so period fabrics are much harder to work with. You usually need a lot more. Okay? But most fabrics come in these two widths. A lot of your upholstery fabrics, the ones that you get in the nice designs for a lot of the brocades, come in 54 to 60 inch wide bases. A lot of your other fabrics are 42 to 45 inch wide. You know, just when you buy the fabric, just look at how wide it is. It'll tell you how wide it is. And if you need a metric conversion, just go online and find the metric conversion. <laughs> uh, you know, basically, two and a half inches or two and a half uh, centimeters per inch. That's about a good. That's a good conversion. All right. So depending on how wide your fabric is depends on how much you will need for it. It also depends on you know, exactly what you're looking at. But for most doublets, okay, with the 42 to 45 inch wide fabric, you will need approximately four yards per layer. Okay? So you'll need four yards of fabric for the fashion. Need four layers for each layer of lining that you want. Okay? For 54 to 60 inch wide, you're looking at around three yards per layer. Okay? It's just because it's wider fabric, it's easier. Now, if you are a person who uh, has been blessed by uh, yeah, with uh, large portions, let's say. Yeah, you may need to buy an extra half a yard. If you're a tiny person, you may need less. But these numbers are usually pretty good. Okay? Usually with these numbers, four yards or three yards, you will have enough excess fabric that if you make a mistake, you can correct it. Okay? You can get away with three yards of 42 to 45 inch wide fabric. You'll have to do some stuff we call piecing, and if you make a mistake, well, you're screwed. <laughs> I always like to have a little bit extra just in case, because I usually make a mistake at some point. Uh, uh, the 54 to 60 inch wide, I have made a doublet out of two yards of 54 to 60 inch wide fabric. Okay? It wasn't easy. <laughs> it took a little bit of extra work, but I was able to do it. So you can get away with less fabric, yes, but you will have to work at it, and if you make a mistake, you'll be in trouble, okay? If you do find some period with fabric, uh, yeah, you're going to need, well, uh, about eight yards of it, yeah, <laughs> per layer, okay? That, that, yeah, that's pretty much it, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, the period with fabrics are much harder to deal with, but they, are so, they, they look so nice when they're done, because usually they're hand-woven fabrics, but yeah. You're going to end up paying more for it, okay? So uh, that's pretty much what you do. If you do decide you want to do leather, generally one hide uh, will get you a double, okay? <laughs> so, yeah, you can look at it that way. Or if you want to figure out the square footage between, you know, of 45 inches wide by 4 yards long, you can figure it out that way. You know, uh, but, yeah, that's generally what you will need. <laughs> Last thing I'm going to talk about is embellishment. Okay, so fabric's nice. Okay, that's what you do. Yeah, that's what you make the barrier. But the things you use to embellish the fabric, which is both make it look pretty, are the things that will make it pop. On the double that I passed around earlier, can you throw that to me there, Richard? Thank you. You will see I have added some trim. I added a little piece of trim to the back to make it pop a little bit, okay? And that trim goes all the way down the sides of the front and around the bottom, and it just adds a little bit of flair to it. This would otherwise just be an ordinary little red doublet, okay? As it is, the gold line breaks it up, and then, of course, I use gold grommets to kind of set off the gold trim, okay? How you design and what you use to embellish your, your doublet is completely up to you. 
Uh, uh, we will be embellishing our doublets at least a little bit just to show you how it works. And I will be bringing in other doublets that I have made to see how, so you can see how I have embellished mine. I'll have some of them next week so that you can see it. But things you can use, first we have what's known as trim. Okay? Trim comes in all different shapes and sizes and colors and everything else like that. If you go on a site called Cheap Trim, or Cheap Trims, they have both, uh, you know, Cheap Trim or CheapTrims.com. Uh, they have lots of trim on there. And you will see what I mean by the variety. The main trim I like to use is what's known as jacquard ribbon trim. Okay? Basically, they took that jacquard fabric and they made it into a nice little ribbon. I like the half inch, the three quarter inch variety, but you know, it's what I like. You know, if you like, completely different. You know? And again, I'll bring in some doublets so you can see you know, how I've used the trim in different ways. I'm going to pass this one around. Please try not to unroll it <laughs> as it goes along. Oops. But you know, those are very nice and they work very well. Similar to the trim is ribbon. Ribbon can be used to embellish. Satin ribbon is a pain to work with because it likes to slide all over the place, but it looks really pretty when it's done. I'll show you some tricks on how to get your trim to stick very nicely. This is a slightly thicker satin ribbon that actually works a little bit better. But again, satin ribbon trims are very nice and can be used for a lot of different things. There are woven trims out there. This, is a, this trim here is known as a French braid trim. You'll find this all over the place. Uh, in the uh, curtain section <laughs> of most fabric stores. Uh, it's used for uh, on curtain rods, uh, curtains and stuff like that. And it's great fun to, to put on. In fact, the trim I have on here is a version of this same trim. Uh, this is a gold shiny version. This is a flat burgundy version. Again, this trim is a lot of fun to use. Uh, it comes in different shapes and sizes. Like I said, this, this woven trim can be nice. The difficulty with woven trim is attaching it. Sometimes it can be difficult to attach. Um, when I do woven trim now, I actually prefer these really thin square ones almost. I love this trim. This is like my favorite trim, the one I'm going to pass around right now. It's my favorite trim to use on basically everything. <laughs> I really like it. It's easy to use and everything else. Is. But some of these woven trims can be a pain. As you'll see, this one actually has scalloped edges on it. And with these scalloped edges, it can be difficult to attach it to the fabric and make it stick, okay? Cording is another popular thing. Uh, cording is usually just like the, the woven trims, only thinner. Uh, cording can be used for a lot of different embellishments and can be handmade. This green cording I'm passing around is used, uses a technique called uh, kumihimo, which is a Japanese braiding technique. And we can also use Elizabethan finger braiding to make a very similar trim. So uh, cording can be used, and it can be used in a lot of different ways. Um, again, I'll, I'll bring in some doublets and stuff like that. Another one of the period designs is something known as inkle or card weaving. Inkle and card weaving trims can be used. They're usually a little bit thick, but they can be very useful and can make some very nice designs. Lace can also be used. This is a, a lace trim that's a very square lace trim. Um, in period, they would use bobbin lace or cut laces, um, yeah, and it could be used for an embellishment. The difficult part of it is, again, attaching it to the fabric and making it look good can be difficult. So, I mean, but a good lace trim can be very, very nice, okay? Trim, however, is not the only way to embellish, okay? Beads, and I'm just going to pass this around as it is. We, we, we'll open it up later and take a look at it. But you can just look at it here. There are lots of different little beads in here. 
And sewing on beads can be a wonderful way to embellish your fabric. This one also has some sequins in it. Sequins are period. They have, they have, they have uh, extant examples with basically sequins which have been made from seashells. Yeah, you know, little shavings of seashells sewn into fabric. So sequins are period. And they can look really awesome. But again, it's work to attach. So <laughs> the more work you put into the doublet, the more gorgeous it will be. But yeah, uh, that's up to you. One of the fun things that we have done in the past is take some of these silly costume buttons that you can find just about everywhere. We'll cut the shaft off and drill a couple little holes in it, and that makes a nice little jewel piece that can go on a doublet. <laughs> you know, it looks like you've just put jewelry on a doublet. So this is a wonderful little way to add a little bit of flair to a doublet. And I'm going to pass around just so you can see some of these costume buttons. And you know, yes, they're all plastic, but they look awesome when they're on, a, on the proper doublet. So. All right, so the last thing we're going to talk about is some, some pieces that we'll use for final construction. Bias tape, which I will not only show you how to use this to construct your doublet, I'll show you how to make bias tape, okay? This bias tape you can actually buy at any fabric store, um, and you know, we'll talk about how wide it needs to be and how much you'll need when we get to that portion of it. But bias tape is how I use, is what I use to do my construction method. I use a construction method called bias tape construction. It's a much easier construction method. You'll actually see period examples of it. Um, rather than what we call the bag and sew method, I'm going to teach you guys both, and we'll talk more about when we get to construction, what the differences are and, and the benefits and, and you, know, you know, bad things about each kind of construction method. But bias tape is your best friend when I when making rapier doublets because you're dealing with lots of layers usually and it makes construction easier. And then the last thing I'm going to pa uh, pass around, this is one of uh, a small selection of the buttons that I have that I use. We are going to be closing our doublets with buttons, okay? I use mostly metal, what we call shafted buttons which means that there's a little loop on the back of the button and that's how we sew the button on, okay? I like buttons that are around a half inch to, to, to five eighths of an inch in diameter. You can go smaller or larger, it's completely up to you, but you will see some of these buttons as they get passed around and, you know, and that kind of thing. There are buttons that we sew through, okay? These are your typical buttons that you see on modern day clothing where you actually sew directly through the button. Again, there are period examples of this, and you can find some really, really nice sew-through buttons. And if that's the direction you want to go, that's fine. When we get to the point of buttons, I'm actually going to show you how to make your own cloth buttons, because those can be very useful as well. So you don't have to go sew searching for buttons, because you know what? When we get to that point, I'm going to bring in all the buttons I own, which is a significant amount, and I'll let you choose buttons from my stash for your doublet. Trust me, I will have enough for everybody, okay? <laughs> you know, the final button you're gonna, you, you'll see in here is what's known as a leather button. It actually has a little screw on the back, and this is how the buttons attach. These are usually used in leather crafting and stuff like that. So, yeah, but yeah, these are just different buttons. There's also some handmade glass bead buttons in here. Uh, we bought these from uh, a merchant who runs the treasury. They're always out at Gulf Wars. They actually cast, they, they've actually casted some buttons from some period pieces too. So they, they make some awesome stuff. So there are merchants out there for just about anything. So this is just a small sample of the buttons I own. So you can see some of the stuff I, I use for buttons. And, you know, and, and the different styles that you know, we'll have to choose from. I have a lot more besides that, trust me, we'll have enough buttons for everybody. So, so buttons are another great way to embellish what you're making and everything else like that. So that's pretty much what we're going to be going through in the class.